From Combined Arms to Combined Intelligence, Philosophy, Doctrine, and Operations, Module 1, by James J. Wirtz and John J. Rosenwasser. Combined Arms Operations, what Stephen Biddle has called the modern system of force employment, emerged during the last century. Those who master combined arms operations generally achieve victory in war, while those who ignore it or concentrate on a single dimension of combat operations generally go down in defeat. The mastery of combined arms operations, however, is no simple matter. Organizational culture and bureaucratic preferences can impede the integration of forces and operations. The quest for quality and professionalism remains a constant struggle. It is often easier to preserve the appearance rather than the substance of competence in peacetime, when the only true test of a military is battle itself. Serious militaries also must constantly work to integrate new technologies, weapons, and operations into the most effective combinations to maximize combat synergies. And even the most exquisitely conceived and brilliantly executed combined arms operations can fail if they are not tied to strategic realities and plausible political objectives. What can intelligence professionals learn from combined arms operations? Combined arms operations are influenced by an underlying philosophy that also can be used to shape the contribution of intelligence to statecraft and national security, especially the effort to defeat denial and deception. Intelligence professionals do battle with opponents who wish to hide their true intentions and capabilities from outside scrutiny. The basic logic of combined arms operations can be applied to the equivalent of the combat arms in the intelligence domain. The functional disciplines of imagery intelligence, IMINT, signals intelligence, SIGINT, measures and signals intelligence, MASINT, human intelligence, HUMINT, and open source intelligence, OSINT. It could also be applied to other aspects of the intelligence enterprise, including counterintelligence, partnerships with foreign intelligence services, and collaboration across state, local, and tribal authorities and the private sector. Each intelligence discipline offers unique strengths, but exhibits serious limitations, including susceptibility to countermeasures especially when implied in isolation. It is their combined employment that amplifies their impact for intelligence professionals seeking to confer a decisive advantage to national officials and homeland security and law enforcement customers. Without an integrating philosophy, the disciplines and their sponsoring intelligence agencies tend to pursue independent efforts in relative isolation, which produces limited combined effects or synergies. It was the effort to overcome this organizational dynamic of bureaucratic stovepiping that has animated many reform efforts, including the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004. Collaboration between and among the intelligence disciplines is certainly not new to the intelligence community. Skilled intelligence professionals have, by necessity or accident, worked across discipline boundaries to address specific problems posed by closed societies or inscrutable trends. There have been many examples of their coordination to meet tactical challenges in specific operations, particularly since World War II. Since September 11, 2001, the interaction has increased to meet the very operational needs of those on the front line of combating terrorist groups, the details of which, quite rightfully, remain classified. But these efforts have occurred largely case by case, with little development of theory, or a family of theories, for how the disciplines can work together so that success can be replicated, let alone scaled. Just as research into the interactive dynamics of the military combat arms yielded combined arms theory 
that Beidel crystallized with empirically based assertions to explain variations in military power, building theory about the interactive effects of the intelligence disciplines can provide insight about what makes intelligence a more or less effective tool of national power. Combined arms operations rely on doctrine to put this underlying philosophy into practice. Intelligence professionals generally do not think of doctrine when it comes to organizing for intelligence, but a doctrine that shapes the way information is collected, fused, and analyzed could facilitate efforts to obtain optimal performance from information age technologies. In an operational sense, combined intelligence operations, much like combined arms operations, also can provide synergies when it comes to collection, analysis, and counterintelligence. The strengths of one intelligence discipline can overcome, or at least minimize, limitations in other disciplines. To support these assertions, the article first describes the philosophy behind combined arms operations and how this philosophy is related to integration of intelligence disciplines. It describes the attributes, strengths, and limitations of the major intelligence disciplines. The article then turns to a brief discussion of the role of doctrine and how it can help operationalize a combined arms approach to intelligence. The article concludes by briefly highlighting some operational implications of adopting a combined intelligence approach, enabling subsequent consideration of how to apply it to best posture, manage, and employ national intelligence programs. The philosophy behind combined arms operations is simple, although extremely difficult to put into practice. The philosophy suggests that whenever possible, a commander should employ multiple categories of forces and weapons in an integrated manner that maximizes their individual effectiveness, offsets their limitations, and produces greater combined effect. Combined usage creates synergy. It also implies that combat objectives can often be achieved with fewer resources and less effort, thereby overcoming opposing units, which may enjoy superior numbers but lack the skill needed to undertake combined arms operations. Like an orchestra, the whole of a combined arms operation is greater than the sum of its parts. An orchestra can achieve a qualitatively different musical effect when compared to a mass of musicians playing various instruments. because the orchestra combines its efforts in a purposive and meaningful way. Similarly, a combined arms operation can produce a battlefield effect far greater than one would expect by simply tallying some quantitative balance of forces. Combined arms operations can allow numerically inferior opponents to defeat far larger armies. By accurately identifying the Schwerpunkt, point of main effort, or disrupting an enemy's normal operational pattern, combined arms attacks can cause an entire army to collapse quickly without horrific attritional engagements that kill thousands more combatants. The philosophy of combined arms operations also turns enemy strengths into weaknesses in potentially myriad ways. For example, if opponents deploy to engage or counter a specific type of weapon or to carry out a particular type of operation, they generally make themselves vulnerable to attack by other types of weapons. In the 1991 Gulf War, for instance, Iraqi armor was buried to hide it from air attack, but then it found itself an easy target when it was engaged at long distance by U.S. armored formations. In the Afghan War, Taliban fighters found it difficult to concentrate to resist the advance of coalition ground forces. The movement of Taliban ground units was almost immediately subject to air attack. In the 1973 Arab-Israeli War, Israeli armor formations, which lacked adequate infantry support, suffered heavy casualties at the hands of Egyptian infantry armed with new wire-guided anti-tank rockets. 
Some observers were quick to announce that the tank had met its match in war, but a combined arms approach in this context soon nullified the advantages enjoyed by infantry armed with man, portable, anti-tank weapons. In fact, the only ways to defeat a combined arms assault are with a superior combined arms defense or asymmetric strategies and tactics, which are intended to circumvent or deny the opponent the benefits of the victory achieved on some battlefield. Nevertheless, several issues complicate the execution of combined arms operations. First, from an operational perspective, it is difficult to determine in advance how best to integrate a wide variety of weapons, units, and tactics into an effective operation, especially as technological advances alter the capabilities of some systems at the expense of others. The particulars of an operation, geography, leadership objectives, and the capabilities and intent of specific enemies create significant challenges when it comes to devising the optimal combined arms operation. Second, ongoing changes in technology, doctrine, and the social and economic aspects of warfare complicate efforts at keeping an effective approach to combined arms operations current. For example, the information revolution has produced ongoing advances in so-called smart weapons, command and control systems, and reconnaissance and surveillance capabilities that require integration into doctrine and planning on a continuous basis. Third, militaries, much like the intelligence community, are made up of competing organizations with their own agendas, institutional processes, and hierarchies. Dominant sectors of the bureaucracy seek to preserve their autonomy and their parochial interests at the expense of organizational interdependence and support to relatively ambiguous collective goals. Such institutional inertia curries support from current bureaucratic beneficiaries, but doctrines and tactics that exist only to satisfy organizational preferences can lead to disaster on some future battlefield. Fourth, militaries, at least the U.S. military, value technology above other facets of combined arms operations. There is a tendency to search for a silver bullet that can guarantee victory regardless of military proficiency. Or, as a British officer once said, when all else fails, we have the Maxim gun and they don't. Ironically, Biddle's suggestion that it was the professionalism of the U.S. military that produced rapid victory in the first Gulf War, actually was met with criticism. Some observers wanted to believe that victory had little to do with the skilled execution of combined arms operations, but was instead based on U.S. technological superiority. The fact that members of the U.S. military were quick to overlook their prowess to attribute victory to the quality of their weapons suggests the presence of a deep psychological need to find some gimmick to hold at bay the horrors of war. One wonders if the intelligence community also looks to technology as a panacea, making up for the ever-present possibility that human frailty, organizational pathologies, or politicization will lead to intelligence failure. Another issue that can emerge is that planners and policymakers can become mesmerized by the operational level of war and fail to pay adequate attention to how combined arms operations serve overall strategic objectives and political realities. The history of war is replete with brilliant military maneuvers that end in strategic disaster. As long as navies ply the oceans, for example, Sailors will talk about the well-conceived and executed Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. What is forgotten is that the attack itself doomed Japan to a long war of attrition it could not win. The successful surprise attack eliminated the political basis of Japanese war plans, i.e., U.S. willingness to reach a compromise settlement in the face of Japanese aggression. Several U.S. military operations during the Vietnam War the defense and relief of Khe Sen and the urban warfare in Hue during the Tet Offensive 
demonstrated U.S. military prowess in conducting combined arms set-piece battles, air mobile operations, and urban warfare. But these successful operations could not overcome the negative impact of unrealistic political objectives. From the intelligence perspective, this idea is equivalent to saying that good tradecraft cannot compensate for misdirected strategy or for embracing objectives that fail to correspond to political realities. As Richard Best recently noted, intelligence analysis can inform policymaking, but it does not substitute for it. Several key facets of the philosophy behind combined arms operations are thus of interest to intelligence managers and analysts. By combining forces and weapons into a coherent and purposive whole, a synergy can be achieved that produces combat capabilities that cannot be achieved by systems operating independently. The enemy becomes vulnerable to defeat because a successful defense against one type of system or tactic leaves it vulnerable to attack by other elements of the combined arms team. Similarly, combined arms operations can prevent the opponent from exploiting one's vulnerabilities because combat synergies can cover the weaknesses that are inherent in any weapon system or operation. More importantly, combined arms operations embrace interdependencies and are based on a systematic analysis that matches operational objectives with the strengths and weaknesses of opposing forces placing this analysis against the backdrop of adversary capabilities and intent. Officers and planners have to believe they are empowered to achieve combat synergies at the expense of organizational and cultural preferences. Military organizations that actually achieve real innovation have to find a way to protect the careers of their young Turks as they follow non-standard career paths and integrate new technologies, tactics, and doctrine into existing organizations.